now. Um, and without further ado, we'll go ahead and let Sarah get started. Thanks, Sarah. Um, as she said, my name is Sarah Jost, and I am the site manager at the Oso Bay Wildlands Preserve, which is a city of Corpus Christi property just over the bridge. If you haven't been to visit us, please come do this. And today we are going to be talking about landscaping for birds here in the coastal bend. So you may have heard that Corpus in our general area is the birdiest city in America. Um, if you've heard that phrase, it has to do with a historic birding competition that happened every spring. Cities would gather their Audubon societies, go out, see how many types of birds they could see, submit their list. And after Corpus won mid-sized city 10 years in a row, I think they stopped having the competition. Uh, but lots of birds come here, but we can do more to be welcoming to them. Um, I know as this area, we talk a lot about welcoming our tourists and our winter Texans and those things that we can also welcome our birds. So some really special birds in the coastal bend. Some of these pictures are from here at Fort A, some are in Corpus. Our wide variety of habitats gives us lots of birds. We can possibly see everything from our grassland birds like quail to our beach birds like sanderlings. But what's cool about the shot, if you aren't super familiar with birds, these are all birds off of a website called eBird that have been seen in the last two years in our county. And the first two is a green-breasted mango. Um, and the second is um, another rare bird. Both of these were seen in private yards. So they weren't seen at some of our really fun birding nature sites. Here in the room, we have some staff from the Port Aransas Nature Preserves. I manage nature preserve. But yards are a really valuable habitat and can attract some really special things. Um, so today we're gonna talk about how your yard or maybe another green space you manage can actually attract some of, again, these really special birds that make our part of the world really cool. And so part of what makes us really special, we are located along two major migratory flyways. I think most of us are, have some awareness that birds migrate. Not all of them do though. Um, but they tend to migrate in what we think of as corridors or highways. We call them flyways for birds. There's one along the east coast, one along the central, and then one that tends to go up the other side of the Rockies. But since many of our birds are going to Central and South America, some of them come down the east coast around Texas through Corpus and then down. So we tend to get birds from both flyways. And then I've been told birds don't read maps very well. So sometimes they get a little lost. So sometimes the ones in the West can make their way to us too with weather systems. We're also in a really cool part of the world where we're kind of in this nice climate region between the subtropics and the tropics. So, you know, Central North America gets lots of really cool birds, some that we don't see. Mexico and Central America get cool birds we don't see, but we're in that space in the middle where we actually do encompass some of these species. So between here where we are in the coastal bend and the valley, there are about 50 species of birds that are only found in that part if you aren't trying to leave the US. So they're not necessarily rare birds on a global scale, but if you're not gonna leave the country, you don't have a passport, travel's not your thing, you like to sit close to home, we're in that really cool sort of region. And then we already talked about our multiple habitat types. It doesn't take long here to get from the beach to some trees, um, to a prairie, to a grassland. And so we have an advantage here. The birds have made it easy for you. And so today I'd like to talk to you about how your yard can be a special place too, where you can see a lot of these really cool birds do a lot of these things. And sort of the concepts that we'll talk about is we do wanna shrink our lawn. Lawns are important if you've got a little kid who needs to play soccer or a dog who needs to go outside and go to the bathroom. Some open grass is important but we really like lawns in this country. We could certainly have some smaller ones while still doing those things. Um, what we are gonna replace our lawn with is some native plants, um, both as food and shelter. Adding water is always a great idea. Um, I think all of us who've been outside in South Texas know that water is a really important thing. Any way you can add it is pretty darn helpful. Reducing or eliminating pesticides, really thinking about how we're controlling what's in our yard. And then lighting is gonna be a very minor part, but talking about dark sky friendly lighting. And so again, just being welcoming. You go to visit some place, you want to see that there's food you recognize and a place you know what a chair is, so you can go sit in the chair. The birds are kind of hoping for the same thing. They want to feel welcome and they're looking for things they recognize. Um, kind of an interesting quote, not from our region, but out of Cook County, which is in Chicago, they did a bird survey and what they found when they went through neighborhoods was that bird diversity had more to do with wildlife friendly elements in yards 
than it was being in a neighborhood surrounded by parks or forest preserves. Um, that was actually going to be a higher indicator of whether or not there was a wide variety of birds. So I guess I'd like to start by saying like your yard is really important. This isn't an addition to the things we do as green space managers. This is a really kind of important spot if we're talking about making our communities bird friendly. Um, a lot of what I'm talking about today does come from Dr. Doug Talney. He is um, the author of two books, Bringing Nature Home and Nature's Best Hope. He is an entomologist studying primarily caterpillars. Um, but what I really like about his overall message is that he really believes our next conservation focus as a country needs to be personal urban landscapes, um, not making more wildlife refuges or another national park, but that the really big impacts that are to be made are in yards. Um, which is actually kind of a fun concept when you think about it because we're not then going to be spending lots of tax dollars and managing. It's really easy to manage something the size of a yard. You know, that can be done on a really nice scale. Um, so our first trick the one, mowed grass is not an ecosystem. Um, I know that sounds really straightforward, we all giggle, but we all have also, or a lot of us, have been raised to think about a yard that's well taken care of, a home that signs of concern has well-edged and trimmed grass. It's green year round. Um, we did, we are in a grassland natively, but certainly not a Bermuda grassland or a St. Augustine one. But if I'm staring at this as a bird, this is looking at a very sad picked over pizza buffet where no, the, none of the pizzas left, it's just plates. Um, that's what they see. And so if I can just start by like, mowed grass, we talked about the purposes it serves for us, but it doesn't serve much for birds. So lawns and yards currently cover 40 million acres of land in the US. If we converted half of that, so again, you get to keep half your yard, to native plants, we'd create what Doug Ptolemy calls a homegrown national park that would be equal in size to 13 national parks combined. So this includes putting Yosemite, Yellowstone, the Grand Canyon, the Adirondacks, um, several Glacier National Park in Denali. If you combine the land mass of all of those, we have more in, yard, in half of our yards. And so this is sort of that statement of like, yeah, we can make another national park or we can all just do our little piece and make a huge impact. Um, so some good goals, right? In a perfect world, we all leave here and we tear out our grass tomorrow. No, that's not it either. Um, think about what the plants in your yard might weigh. So if you've got a really large oak tree or even in our area where they gave out Chinese tallows in the 80s, if you have a really nice big tree, that tree is pretty heavy, it weighs a lot. If you have a yard, it weighs a decent amount. If you have lots of bushes, we're somewhere in the middle. But our good goal for this project that we've shown has a smart effect on birds is about 70% of the biomass being native. So let's say you have an old native tree and you don't want to take it out. I hear you. I think that's a really smart thing. You can't buy a big old tree. So then if we do that, we might need to be using native shrubs and native flowers. If your yard, you're really into roses, that's your take home, you've got to have it, then I'm going to ask you to please put in a big native tree. And so we're talking about balancing this um, in our weight and our size. And so um, this yard right here, I think is a really good example. I don't think all the box shrubs in front of their windows are native, but then their front shrub line is because they wanted something that was low, that could be groomed really well, because they would like to let light into this front window. That makes sense. This is still a place where we're living also. Um, and then many of us do live in areas with HOAs or neighbors who maybe don't understand what we're doing. So we do have to remember that switching to natives, what's nice is they do survive quite well. Um, I know my experience and Ray, I imagine y'all's was similar at the preserve is that your natives came back from the freeze really well. You had to give them some time. They didn't look great the next day, but you didn't probably have to put in a whole bunch of new plants. Um, but they don't always look nice and neat like an arboretum if we don't do maintenance. So to have your yard look nice and landscape, it's still going to require work. I'm not even going to pretend to tell you if that's not the case, but they will do a lot better here. You can use less irrigation. You can certainly use less fertilizers, um, but thinking about when you're putting these in, defined edges. So having this nice, nice path so people can tell this is done on purpose. Um, this bottom right corner, if you're staring at it, that's a video off of a Facebook group where they told me they put in um, some of the really light impact uh, landscape fencing and you can't see it, but it's holding up their plants as they got droopy later in the year. 
So it's hidden in all that foliage. It's just these little light wire green prints, but it's making it look a lot more cared for. Still gonna require some weeding, still gonna require some deadheading potentially if you don't want it to look super crazy. Um, and then thinking about awareness signs. So there are several nonprofits you can choose to donate to to get a sign. The National Wildlife Federation certifies lawns as wildlife habitat. You get your yard certified as a monarch way station. But if you're putting these signs out, your neighbors in your community aren't gonna say, oh, those are the people who don't mow their yard. They're going to understand that you're taking care of your yard just in a different way. Um, and that's showing that we still care. We haven't just walked away from our landscape because we don't want to do yard work anymore. And then it's about choosing our plants. So really, although this is a bird presentation and you've started asking what birds are we going to talk about, it's actually about to become a caterpillar presentation because landscaping for birds and wildlife actually is landscaping for caterpillars. Um, and so I like Doug Tommy's quote here, caterpillars are bird sausage. They're squishy, they're full of protein, you can shove them in a baby bird's mouth because if you think about us feeding baby birds, you know, they don't chew at first. Moms just come in there with that really sharp beak and shove it in there. They'd rather a big squishy caterpillar, even with its few spines, than a beetle with really pokey legs or a grasshopper with wings. Um, most of our small nesting songbirds tend to prefer caterpillars. Not all, but most. Um, a study done in West Virginia shows that for a chickadee, which is a pretty common yard bird, most of the country but not here takes about 7500 caterpillars to raise the four to five young out of that nest so <coughs> even if they eat seeds as an adult they're feeding their young insects and they're often feeding them caterpillars so if we want to landscape for birds we have to feed them right if i'm inviting you to a pool party you're gonna be really upset if there's no food so What's nice is someone's already done the research for you. There are groups of plants that will host more caterpillars than others. And Sarah, very helpfully, I saw, thank you earlier, dropped a link in the chat. Um, there is a PDF of um, this list and a nice checklist for yards. Um, but in saying all of this, where you are, and potentially we have some people online who aren't here immediately in the coastal bend, this still requires you to do a little bit of research about what's native to where you are within these families. So there are oaks across the world. Here we'd want live oaks. Maybe in central Texas we want burr oaks. So we want to think about which things in these groups fit. But oaks nationally host over 900 species of caterpillars. Um, so a lot of those are moths, they're not big showy butterflies we think about. So if we're gonna get the bang for our buck and we can put a big oak tree in, we're gonna have lots of bird food, plus that shelter in the nesting space we talked about earlier, shade for your house. Um, sunflowers and sages or salvias are another big group that hosts lots and lots of, um, excuse me, caterpillars. I put milkweeds on here, although of them, they're the, probably the most famous, but they're not the most diverse. They're really popular for hosting monarchs, which are kind of an interesting butterfly because like birds, they migrate. Most butterflies don't migrate or if they do their very regional migration. And milkweed is incredibly important to them. Um, but there's only about eight or 10 other species that actually host on or feed on milkweeds. Um, so you're helping monarchs, you're helping queens, viceroys and soldiers, but kind of running out after that. Um, willows, so if you're still looking for trees, you've got some water. Muleys are a grass, so ornamental grasses can be a really nice part of what you're doing. And again, hosting good caterpillars, um, tick seeds, goldenrods, coneflowers. There's also through the National Wildlife um, Federation, if you Google uh, native plant finder, you can put in your zip code and it will pull up a list of plants for your zip code. Um, so again, for those of you online who might be tuning in from a little bit further away. So we want to be, again, strategic, most bang for our buck. And then kind of a question I've been researching a little bit more lately is nativars and cultivars. So I've given you this list, you've got your checklist, you're off to the nursery, and you're going to maybe, if you're familiar with plants in our area, realize that the stuff in the nursery doesn't quite look like the stuff at some of the nature spaces. So we grow in cultivation, in captivity, basically, a lot of plants. We breed them, those are the ones that get sold. The plants, if you went and dug it up out of the side of the road as you're driving, you know, would be called a straight species. And so a native bar is a cultivated type of native plant. And so what I want to know is, does it make a difference? Are you still helping? 
And research is kind of mixed. It's 50-50 on whether this is appropriate. Um, what they're starting to show is if you want to benefit your natives, aim for similar colors and structures. So this is one type of purple coneflower. If you're finding it in yellow or white and it's labeled purple coneflower, you can assume that an animal might not recognize it. They don't know that it comes in white now versus purple. Um, structures. This is closer to the straight species. You can see that this butterfly can get in to get nectar. This is the exact same plant, just another variety. But can you imagine if you're a butterfly trying to get your tongue in there, right? It would be really squished. So this one might look prettier in your yard, right? Like if you're driving by, you're looking, oh, that's a big pink fluff. I'm gonna call in the birds and the butterflies, but it's gonna get there and it can't eat from it. It's like putting a big plastic case over that food I just offered you. You, know, you can see it, but you can't get in there. Um, Overall plant size doesn't seem to have a negative effect. So we have some dwarf varieties of things that might go better in your home landscape. That doesn't seem to be a problem. So if you're like, I know this normally gets 12 feet tall, the dwarf one says it's only six, that's probably fine. Um, some native ours, when we get to our fruits, especially like our blueberries have larger fruits. We think about feeding a bird, that might be helpful actually. You know, they're eating, they can eat less numbers of them and get more food. Um, if you're really truly worried about our finches, we talked about finches um, before we started, they're going to come in and eat seeds off these plants in the winter. Well, some of our native ours are sterile, so they don't produce seeds. So if you're here for the color and the nectar, this is probably not an issue for you. If you're putting this in because you wanted seeds from this plant later, you might have to go do a little research on that particular plant you're looking at to see if it is going to produce seeds. It also tells you if it's worth deadheading or not. Because if they're not going to get any seeds from it, there's really no point in leaving that flower head out there once it's spent. So just kind of an awareness of even though I gave you a whole list of plant names and now you're going to the nursery, it may still not quite be what you're finding in the wild, but we're starting to show that's probably okay. We just need to be sort of mindful about what we're doing with that. Um, the next is be generous with your plantings. So um, clumps and clusters are certainly much more efficient. Um, birds and butterflies are used to, you know, think about it, they're flying from a little bit higher, they wanna see it, they come in. There's not much nectar in a little bitty flower. And so if I have to go to eight, 10, 12, 15 flowers to get my breakfast, I'd like them to be close together. Because if they're further apart, I'm gonna use more energy to get to them. Um, so, Kind of my example here is it might be better to have six plants of three species than have 18 different plants in your yard. You're thinking maybe I'm serving more caterpillars or I'm serving more things because they like this, but if there's not enough of it for them to get what they need from it, it might have just been for show. So really think about clumping and clustering. And honestly, it looks a little bit visually interesting. So again, you can see how they are here in the yards. Also then if you're gonna plan less species, planning so that they are blooming across the year. If you pick all things that bloom in the spring, what's happening right now in the fall when our birds are getting ready to migrate south, there's not much food for them there. But also leaving some open spaces for our native ground nesting bees. So we talked about clumps, but maybe leaving some space between your clumps. I think the top one kind of shows this a little bit better. It's also gonna help you when you go back to do your lawn maintenance. You can get around and pull out the things you don't want. But um, there are a lot of bees in the world that are not honeybees and they often nest alone in the ground. So I'm not talking about big ground nesting yellow jackets if you're from a part of the world where that's the thing and you're thinking, I don't want that in my yard at all. It's not what we're talking about. We're talking about one bee with two or three babies in a hole in the open ground. Um, and they're just what's gonna keep your plants healthy and happy because they're gonna be pollinating them and moving um, stuff around. So here's a couple of pictures of some native bees. And um, one of my favorite statements is, keeping hives to save the bees is like keeping chickens to save the birds. So I know at least one person in the room has chickens. Do you think you're saving the bird populations with your chickens? Well, you're trying to eat dinner, right? Which is important, maybe get some eggs. Um, you enjoy them as companion animals. So saving the bees has been a really big movement in our country for a while. And I am not at all going to minimize the importance of bees. I enjoy going to the grocery store and having a diversity of things, but they are an agricultural crop. They are not native to this country. It's the European honeybee actually is the honeybee that we're familiar with. Um, so if we're thinking about saving birds and we're thinking about saving the bees, 
not chickens and not those bees. Um, I'm not trying to put Tyson or, you know, bear honey out of business. Just saying if we're talking about saving wildlife, that's a different topic. Those are important for our agriculture and our economics. The good news is if you've read some advice about saving bees, it's probably appropriate for these guys too. So being mindful of buying plants that don't have neonectinides or pesticides already in them, that don't have systemic pesticides, meaning they're grown with pesticides in the soil, so the leaves don't taste good to bugs. That's still all really good advice for our native bees, but I just like to point out that um, it's not the honey. And then thinking about those pesticides that we just talked about, it leads really great to that. Hopefully you have understood so far, the point of this is we want bird food if we're landscaping for birds and birds eat bugs. So if we turn around and then put pesticides on our yard to kill the bugs, we killed the bird food. And now we're back to like, well, there's all these birds and they have nothing to eat. Um, so the general idea is to have this wide variety of insects. When you're choosing native plants though, they have some of their own defenses. So those of you who are familiar with organic pesticides, often those are made from plant compounds because someone went and researched like, hey, this bug doesn't eat this plant. I wonder what's in it that doesn't make them eat it. Well, if you have a native plant, that bug that doesn't eat it probably lives here. And so it doesn't need you to go spray it with more of it. It's already protecting itself. And then the birds and the lizards and the other things that live in your yard actually will come eat the other things. Now, if you're trying to do this in the yard where you're also growing food or ornamentals, you might need to be strategic about it. So if you have a small area that's isolated, maybe you can do manual removal or very minimal something um, if you feel like that's necessary. Um, there's some obviously better options than wide range. This kills everything it touches versus I have a very specific problem and this chemical seems to do something about that. And then obviously being very careful about package directions and using as little as possible. But on a grand scale, I really, we don't, if we're using smart plantings, we can stop using yard-wide herbicides and pesticides because we're growing the things that are supposed to be here. And so now the cycle kind of balances itself. It also means getting a little bit comfortable with the fact that your plants might get eaten a little bit. So um, if, again, I follow a native plant group and someone put in passion flower for gulf fritillaries because they'd seen this picture of this butterfly. It's orange and white on the backside, almost looks silvery and they were super excited. They heard that fritillaries liked passion flowers and they put in their passion flowers and the fritillaries came and they laid eggs and then they went out two days later and half the leaves were gone off their passion flower. And they're like, I gotta kill the caterpillars. No, no, the caterpillars came from the butterfly you were attracting. And luckily they were in a group where they were open to that feedback. And what they reminded them is, if this relationship between fritillaries and passion vine has been going on for a long time, they're not going to eat so much of it that it won't come back. Um, so remember that you built the plants there to be eaten by the bugs that are going to get eaten by the birds. Leaf cutter bees will sometimes take out little chunks of leaves and we might think something is really harming our plant. But again, animals are sometimes a little bit smarter than uh, people, although we're also animals. They maybe They've got to figure it out. They're not going to take away all of their food. Um, and then help spreading the message. So the what and why. Um, I really appreciate Ray and Kevin and UCMSI asking me to come talk. Um, one of our goals is to get out the word about this program called Bird City Texas. Super fortunate to be standing in Port Aransas where they have met this certification. They're one of seven cities across the state that has put together a wide range of ordinances and policies that says not only are we the birdiest city, we're also bird friendly. We're welcoming of them when they get here. At this time, Corpus Christi is not one. We're continuing to work towards that process. Um, and we do that by making people more aware and by helping people become advocates. So if you start making some changes in your yard and your neighbors or people who walk by are like, what's the deal with this? Maybe you're in an HOA that does a newsletter, offer to put a little piece together about why. But kind of convince people this stuff isn't weird. It's very normal and it makes a lot of good sense. Um, advocating at your council level or again, your smaller level for ordinances and policies that support ecologically healthy yards. Um, clearly defining weeds and tall plants versus unkempt yards. We talked about that with the fencing and the defined edges. I got a phone call about a year ago from a family who moved in near the preserve and they put in milkweed and they put it in a mulch bed 
and uh, their next door neighbors don't like it. So they called code enforcement and code enforcement came out and very reasonably talked to them. And they said, but what's the name of this plant? They said, milkweed. And they said, well, that's a weed and it's over 12 inches. They got it all sorted, but it took a lot more than it needed to, right? So if we could start defining more effectively what we mean by an unkempt yard, we certainly want properties cared for versus tall plants. It's okay that some of our plants get tall at certain times of year. And what does that mean to maintenance them and helping us? Um, reducing widespread spraying for insects. We have had several, a handful of West Nile cases here. We can't not treat for mosquitoes ever, but we can do things like the city of Corpus does, which is test certain spaces. And when those mosquitoes come positive, go treat a specific area. Um, while aerial spraying is far from great, the alternative sometimes is putting stuff in the water that can also kill dragonfly larvae dragonflies are a huge feeder of purple martin. So about being targeted and being smart about this, not it's Tuesday, I guess we should go spray, but like, hey, we've noticed mosquitoes of this density, or we've noticed that there are some human health concerns here. Now let's go use these methods to treat. Um, and then reducing lighting at night for um, bird and moth health. So hopefully some of you saw, we did do a story this week about reducing lights at night for bird migration. But this is more about everyday kinds of things. Um, you and I and the birds outside and the moths all evolved on a night day cycle. I'm sure we've all seen people with the funny blue light sunglasses. Don't spend too much time on your computer. It makes you not sleepy. Um, you know, we've heard to put down your screens at night. It keeps you awake. Um, animals are need day night too. Um, they're starting to think that lights on, especially porch lights, might have something to do with declining moth populations, that they're spending all their energy responding to this light at night and getting no food from it. Um, it seems more male moths are attracted to the lights than the females, so they're not even finding friends there and laying eggs. It's a very bad nightclub model. Um, so if we can turn off our lights or reduce it, again, those moths are going to go on to actually make babies and feed our birds. Um, so the real term if you're looking for lighting or replacing lighting is usually sky friendly or dark sky friendly lighting. Um, that's usually how it's advertised. But um, sky friendly lighting is wildlife friendly lighting. So a lot of towns are going to dark sky ordinances more thinking about their night sky and their star view. Uh, Dripping Springs, Texas is a dark sky friendly community. Um, and so we can get better and worse options with our lighting. Obviously unshielded, the light's going every which way, there's nothing protecting it. All the way down to fully shielded, the light's pointing at the ground, you notice it's not going very far. There's also different color families you can look at. In general, yellow light is better than white light, but you can, you know, if this is important to you, do some good research about what things. My suggestion is to consider switching to motion activated lighting. I know a lot of us have some security concerns, whether it's someone else around our house or maybe we don't see well at night. And we want to be able to walk up our front steps and not trip. Well, if the lights come on when something moves, you're going to be able to see whether it's the person who doesn't belong there or you just need to be able to see to reach in your bag to get your house keys. And then when you're done moving, the lights turn back off and our animals aren't going to be as affected by that. And then this lights out movement, um, 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. is kind of the general suggested thing, especially on buildings over three stories tall during our spring and fall migrations. So we're talking about birds that are crossing continents. They are definitely using moons and stars <clears throat> and light reflecting off the grounds to make a very long path of where they're going. And if we cannot distract them with our lights, I think all the better for it. It'd be a shame for them to have four or five babies in your yard with all those bird friendly plants and not be able to make it down south for the winter and come back and raise kids and grandkids the next year. Um, with that, questions? Um, Sarah, if anybody's got one in the chat, anybody here in the room, I appreciate y'all's time today. You said create shelters. Mm -hmm. What exactly kind of shelters are you create? I'm, I'm just thinking birdhouses. So yep, so that's the number out. one question we can ask. Yeah. And did you, there was no birdhouses in Yeah, there, there was not, so. Um, we don't have so. many cavity nesting birds here. Historically, this was a grassland. So big, old, tall, hollow trees, not so much of a thing. Um, instead, we're talking about good shrubbery that they can hide from larger birds, hide from, unfortunately, your neighbor's cat. Mm -hmm. um, you can put up a birdhouse. If you want, I'm not going to tell you not to. Purple Martin houses do really well here. 
Um, they've been helped by humans for hundreds of years at this point is what research is showing. But stuff for wrens and screech owls is not, not helpful, but it's not as helpful here as it might be in some other places in the state. Um, so for us, shelter is going to be picking those mid-sized shrubs um, and some large trees so they can get off the ground and get some hiding spaces. Thank you for that. Sure, is any of these listed we on there? Is any of them sheltered? Okay. I do have one question in the comments from Eric. He wants okay. to know, does fertilizer detour birds from the area where you spread it? Sorry, I'm gonna move a little bit closer to the speaker and have you repeat that, please. Fertilizer. Does fertilizer deter birds from the area where you spread it? Um, I don't know if it's going to deter it, but again, with our native plantings, they're meant to be in our soils, so we shouldn't have to use as much of it. Um, a part of the reason we put so much fertilizer on lawns is we're trying to grow a different kind of grass in a place where that grass wasn't going to grow. Um, so that's what's really nice about fertilizers is are about choosing our native plants. You should almost be able to eliminate or reduce your fertilizer use. Um, but as far as like it having a chemical offput, if you're choosing a smart fertilizer, it is just nitrogen, phosphorus, um, it should be okay. Should, being the operative word here. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, if anyone else online has any questions, feel free to pop those in the chat. While they do that, Sarah, we've got one more here in the room. So we'll give people a minute to type theirs and then get started. Just, just to be clear, uh, when we were speaking of the wildlife friendly elements mm -hmm. moving on, and that would be the lawn, native biomass, choosing the right, okay, mm -hmm. just making sure. Yeah. Water and less There's pesticides. Uh, would putting, now that you mentioned water, putting water, I'm thinking about making some stands up higher up off the ground, but of course, easy for me to, to put fountains up there. So it's high, if, am, I, am I making any kind of progress on helping bring birds? Because I do have a cat. Yeah. I, well, my daughter has a cat. I don't have a cat, but my daughter does. So yeah. I was, is that worth even trying to do is to make something high? The good bird biologist in me is going to say your cat needs a bell to be inside or a catio mm -hmm. screened in porch for it. So yeah. we can, catios are a thing. Yeah. Google them. They're super uh -huh. cool. People built some really fancy ones like where they almost use like the window as a cat door and then it goes, yeah. That's my first answer. I get that that doesn't work for everybody, but I gotta, I gotta put that out there. Um, honestly, what can maybe help the most is shrubs that are either pokey, which is great because we live in a thorn scrub, so we can find lots of pokey shrubs. The birds don't care, the cat might, so they can retreat into that. Um, but naturally, they're not gonna find water up high, so I'm not sure that they wouldn't go to it, but I don't know if they're gonna be looking for it. Um, small drips work better than bird baths. Um, so something that just drips onto a big open rock or that's nice and open so the birds can see the cat coming. Um, so you've got your shrub maybe where my computer is and your water bowl is over here out in the open. They can go hide. They can see the cat coming. They do have the advantage of wings. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. right, Sarah, did anything come in on our chat? Yeah, we have a question from Linda. She wants to know if we have any state laws regarding light pollution. Statewide, we do not. Um, there are individual city ordinances, so that's things people should look up in their region. San Antonio, Houston, Austin, and Dallas have all joined Lights Out initiatives, but I don't know that they've changed any of their ordinances yet. Again, I mentioned Dripping Springs, and I know some of the areas in West Texas around the McDonald Observatory. They have some city specific ordinances because they want to night sky is a tourism draw for them. But statewide, no, there are no policies on that. So if you're looking for one, you need to look in your very specific region. I believe out four days ordinance has more to do with keeping your light on your property. So you can't shine light in your neighbor's yes. windows and on your neighbor's yard, but um, that's the other benefit of like switching from this partially shielded to fully shielded light. Not only are you helping the birds, but yeah, you're keeping it out of somebody else's window. They've shown too that those types of lights on the right are safer because yeah. it is directing more light to where you are and where you might need you're to, trying be, to be. be safe or whatever. All right, we have another one uh, from Linda. With pollination and okra being a summer plant, their flowers are prolific. Will these plants help? 
Uh, so we're talking about plants that aren't blooming specifically in summer, correct? Um, I think she's asking specifically about okra um, and if that's a good pollinator for um, if you, again, okra, I'd have to go look at where okra is native to, but I think it might actually be native to the Americas, maybe more South America than here. Um, beneficial for pollinators to some extent, most flowers make nectar. Again, we want plants that flower year round. We certainly, as people who are growing food, want pollinators to find our food plants along with our native plants. Um, so anything with the flower that has good nectar sources can feed them. They're not pollinating on purpose. What they're doing is they're sticking heads and tongues and trying to get nectar out. And they're just kind of clumsy and pollen goes with them. And when they go to the next plant, they take that pollen. And the benefit for us is okra and squash and tomatoes. The benefit for outside is mesquite beans and more lime prickly ash and all of those good things. I've got one more here in the classroom, Sarah. All right. I actually live at my business, so I need some of the, uh, I'm just going to call it carpet grass because that's what I know. I don't yeah. know if it's where it's gone, so whatever. Yeah. <clears throat> Is there any kind of, like, I can let mine grow five or six inches. Would that be best to kind of uh, let it grow as high as it'll go? I mean, it, is there anything I can do to help improve what I've got um, rather than having to fill the whole area you with have the to have native it plants? For what I'm, like you said, yeah, you've got to have it. Business. I think the better alternative is to make really smart choices in the places you don't have to have it. And just to see like, that's cool. I need a driveway to park on, right? So there's no native plants where I park my car. I think you just call that your driveway. Kirk, I see that you're wearing a Coastal Bend kayak shirt. So those who can't see you, that's the kayak driveway. Mm -hmm. and it's just gotta be there. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna make some really smart choices around our driveway. And I think that's how you balance that for you. I mean, some length is good, but Again, about the not in ecosystem, it's because it's not really supporting bugs. Mm -hmm. um, it's not native to here, so the bugs aren't really eating it. So no, grackles might go feed in it from where the dragonflies lay. Yeah. Obviously, a little bit of height will give them some shelter. But I think at that point for you, you just consider it a part of the infrastructure you have to have. Um, and that makes sense to me. I get that. And you make your smarter choices around it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. We have a question um, from Jeanette. What about the bee houses available at Costco and other stores? Would that be helpful to the native bees? Yes. So I'm glad someone asked that question. So there are um, Costco and some of the other big box stores have started selling um, bee hotels or native bee houses. Um, they're usually a set of little tubes or blocks with drilled holes in them. And those are meant to host those solitary bees we talked about earlier. So if they're hive kits, I'm gonna say no, but I happen to own a native bee hotel from Costco. So I might assume that's what we're asking about here. Um, and those are really helpful. It you know, can make the space of um, dead flower tubes or dead trees that we can't always leave standing in our communities because they might fall on a house or infrastructure. Um, we can't always leave all that dead vegetation on the landscape, but we can replicate the holes from it um, in those structures. One thing to be aware of with those though is that you do need to clean them out every year, which might mean you need to buy new inserts because bees like people carry diseases. If you think about having a bunch of people in an apartment, when you move into the apartment, you want them to maybe have painted and taken out the carpet and cleaned it before you move in. Same thing for those for the next year. So get your new wood blocks, get your new tubes. And if you start looking into them, they're very simple to make. Um, you can buy them, but they, they don't need to be complicated. Um, there's some good instructions out on the internet about size hole and opening and whatnot. Um, but yes, those can be and are very beneficial. Thanks. Um, real quick, just another one from Linda. Is there a better color flower that is uh, more attractive or most attractive? Uh, vary it up as many. Back to my caveat about it's better to have clumps of smaller things, but um, hummingbirds tend to like red, but other things notice yellow, some things notice orange. Different insects and different birds see things on the spectrum. So variety is, again, the spice of life. So if we're choosing native varieties, um, having more options to do that is um, more appropriate. 
I did see Sarah that pop up about uh, time to clean bee houses. That's when I don't have stored in my brain. Um, Google is just as useful as I am at that point, not to be unhelpful. Okay, we've got one more in the comments. Do you have any in the room you want to take real quick? No, we're here. We're good here. You're here? Okay, so then from Doris, uh, wild rose is listed as a desirable plant. How does that differ from regular roses? And where would I find these as I do like roses? Um, so wild roses are in a different genus. They're actually a totally different plant. We like to name things based on what they look like, not what they're related to. Um, so they might look very structurally similar to you and I, which is great if that's a look you like. Um, but to our pollinators and our caterpillars and our beetles, they're going to taste very different. Um, and that for lack of a better word, they'll have the different chemicals that put off different bugs. Um, and the best is to call your nursery. So if you have a favorite local nursery and you go take that list and you look some stuff up and you're like this one, you know, you really like wild roses or you find something that makes sense where you are, call and ask your nurseries to get them. Because if people start calling and asking for these native plants, guess what they're going to start carrying? Our native plants, right? They want to serve you as a business. They recognize us as regular customers. Um, so the best thing I can tell you is where to find them is um, call your nurseries and ask if they can get them. Just because they don't carry them in store doesn't mean their suppliers don't have them always. Um, but I would ask people to support their local the local nursery that has served them best up to this point, because that's what we do. There's another. Yes. Yes. Bill Green works for the uh, Forest Service. It sounds like he's contributing some helpful information in the chat there, which I thank you, Bill. I appreciate that. Yes, Bill, thanks. Right, I don't see any more comments or questions in the chat. Um, I'm, I've got some very comfortable people in this dark, cool room who I think might need to take a stretch break too. <laughs> Everybody's awake, but I think they might need a good stretch. All right, well, thank you guys for being here today. Thank you for your time and for having me. Again, my email address is here, and there's also plenty of places to check out what the preserve is doing. I hope you get a chance to come visit us. If I'm a little bit further away, please visit um, the Puerto Aransas Nature Preserves, who's a part of hosting this. Um, another great place to see what's native, what's done well, what's bringing in birds, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. So when you think of it, email me because I can tell that you were. Oh, I was trying to figure out what.